Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, Elizabeth Curley Flynn is my hero. That's no exaggeration and has been since I was a student um, many years ago. So it's a thrill to be talking about uh, her with you tonight. Um, and so my name is Marianne Trasciati. I teach at Hofstra University. I teach in the program uh, Rhetoric and Public Advocacy. I teach political communication, persuasion, public speaking. Um, I teach courses on social protest. Uh, and I also direct the labor studies program. And in addition to that work, I am the president of an organization, a nonprofit called Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. We do a lot of work to educate people about the 1911 fire and to call attention to the need for workplace safety today and for, to the struggles of uh, immigrant workers, particularly women. And with that organization, I'm actually leading the campaign to build up memorial, it will be New York's first significant labor memorial to the Triangle Fire, to the people who died in the fire. Um, and we will be uh, dedicating that memorial, I hope, uh, in the next year. Um, I have written the foreword to my life as a political prisoner, and that was a, a labor of love. It was really fun and exciting to do that. And I am also now uh, working on putting the finishing touches on a manuscript on Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's civil liberties activism. Uh, the book is tentatively called The Rebel Girl, Democracy and Revolution, and it will be published by Rutgers University Press. So if you like what you hear tonight, uh, some of it comes from uh, my life as a political prisoner, but some of it also comes from my my uh, soon, I hope to be soon to be published book. Um, I hope you will look for the book. I think it's really great that, uh, in fact, I think it's perfect timing to be doing this webinar on March 8th, International Working Women's uh, Day. And I think that Elizabeth Gurley Flynn would have approved. Um, and, and she actually wrote about the importance of knowing the history of women who have been active in the labor movement. Um, in a piece, I'm gonna quote to you from a piece that she published in the Daily Worker in 1942. And I think she's directing her comments to men. And I think it's important for men to hear these, but I, I think it's these are sentiments that I think uh, apply to everyone. Uh, it would be excellent, she wrote, for the men who lead labor to take a little time out to read up on the history of women in the labor movement. It would help them today to organize women. All too many leaders of strong progressive unions have blind spots where this job is concerned. They're behind the time because they have not yet accepted as a finality the permanence of women in the labor movement. And again, she wrote this in 1942, but I think these words could have been written today. Um, and Flynn was absolutely central to the 20th century labor movement. And the title of this webinar is The Life of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And that was a, a big life, no exaggeration. Uh, Flynn was involved in just about every major struggle of the left in the first two thirds of the 20th century. We absolutely cannot cover all of the aspects of her life and those struggles tonight, but we will hit three, I will cover three major points and I hope tie a lot of things together and then we'll have questions and comments. And I, I really look forward to hearing from you, your thoughts, your questions, uh, your comments. So the three things I'd like for us to talk about are first, how Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was a homegrown radical and why that's important. Second, uh, her, uh, her, relationship to movements, that she was a movement person. I know this is a Marxist class, but Flynn, I would actually call her not so much a Marxist, but a movement activist um, and what, what that means. Um, and then finally, I'd like uh, to talk about her central role that she played in the US civil liberties uh, movement throughout the 20th century and why that's, that is, was and is and, and will always be important. Um, and, and finally, a question I'd like to hear from some of you uh, in response to is, why isn't Flynn better known? Um, she's so important and so interesting. Um, and I, and it, it, I throw this question around a lot as I, as I do my work on her because I find her so exciting. Um, but she is really underappreciated, I think. And, I, and I, I'd love for us to talk about that a little bit. So, so let's talk first about Flynn as a homegrown radical. And why is this important? Uh, well, uh, for much of the 20th century, a red was an epi epithet, much like terrorist is today, right? So to call someone a red was like to call them a terrorist today. And fear of reds 
was manipulated uh, by the federal government, by state and local governments to justify repression, and in the case of the federal government, to justify deportation. And the reason it's important to acknowledge Flynn as a homegrown red um, is that her biography gives lie to this myth that the left and left-based class politics are foreign phenomena, right? They're imports. We don't grow radicalism on American soil. And that, that was the argument um, throughout most of the 20th century. So Flynn was born uh, in New Hampshire. She's a New Englander by birth, August 8th, 1890. And her family moved to the Bronx when she was a young, uh, about 10 years old. Um, and, I, and I have here, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have some photos. She was, she was quite beautiful, um, quite stunning actually, I would say, and uh, a real head turner. And that was part of the, uh, I think the key to her early appeal. Um, she lived among poor and struggling immigrant working class people. Her mom was Irish and her dad was Irish American. And her parents were socialists. They were fighters for Irish freedom. And the Flynn family was friends with James Connolly, the socialist martyr and the hero of the Easter uprising, as well as James Larkin, uh, another Irish uh, radical socialist. And these relationships really helped to shape her politics. She was an extraordinary bright and gifted speaker and a, and a champion debater. And she launched her public career from a soapbox in Times Square in 1906, when she was uh, not quite 16 years old. And she got arrested for blocking traffic. She was such a sight to behold and such a powerful speaker that she stopped people in her tracks. The material conditions uh, around her as a, as a child and a young adult and the ideological education that she got from her family and friends were the foundation for Flynn's deep understanding of inequality uh, in the United States, which led her to dedicate herself to the struggle to make life better for all working people. And they were also um, the foundation for her broad internationalist vision. To be an Irish American for Flynn was to be an ally of the oppressed at home through active participation in the class struggle and an ally abroad through support for anti-imperialist movements around the globe. And, and we will talk some more about that. So the second point that I would I would like to make tonight is that uh, although Flynn was a stalwart class warrior I and mean, she dedicated her life to the class uh, to class war, she was not an ideologue. She's been called theoretically unsophisticated, and that's that's not fair and it's not true. She read Marx. She read Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards. I mean, she read all of the classic texts. Um, but she was a movement person first and foremost, right? She was in the streets. She was committed to the struggle. And the most important thing to her was to be actively engaged in advancing that struggle. Um, so theory was important, but it was boots on the ground activism that was central uh, to her political life. And that political life is divided into two parts. Um, part one, is the rebel girl, right? And uh, most people are familiar with Flynn, the rebel girl. And I, I actually have here a cherished possession of mine. This may be familiar to, to some people who are watching. Um, it's actually the cover, the sheet music uh, for the song that Joe Hill wrote, which he dedicated to Flynn. He called it the rebel girl. Um, Joe Hill was a wobbly poet. He was executed in 1915 for allegedly uh, killing a grocery store owner and his son in Utah. Um, despite petitions to save his life, he was executed by firing squad. And he wrote to Gurley Flynn shortly before he was executed. And it is Joe Hill who coined the famous expression, don't mourn, organize. And it was Joe Hill who named Elizabeth Gurley Flynn the rebel girl. Uh, the rebel girl is also the title of Flynn's biography. The original title was I Speak My Own Peace. It was taken from a, a quote. She was asked after um, she had been observed speaking and she was so dynamic, she was asked if she wanted to join the theater. And she said, no, I'm in the labor movement and I speak my own piece. But the book was later titled The Rebel Girl. Um, and it is an account of her first life uh, until 1926. So this is Flynn's syndicalist period, right? This is the period in which she is a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, um, a radical union dedicating, dedicated to organizing all workers in all industries and committed to direct action, right? So the IWW or the Wobblies, as they were called, they had no truck with politics, with electoral politics of any sort. In fact, Flynn, when she was a Wobbly, um, 
was anti, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say she was anti-suffrage, but she was not a suffragist. Um, she thought suffrage was a distraction that, you know, what are you going to say to working women on the picket line? Wait, hey, it's election day, go and vote and your lives will be better. For Flynn, that made no sense, that the struggle for men as well as women was on the picket line, in the factory, on the shop floor, at the point of production. So direct action gets the goods, right? And that's, that's an IWW slogan. And she became an organizer for the IWW. She was just 16 years old. And as she says in her autobiography, I took to it like a duck to water. And boy, did she. She was terrific. Um, and the IWW was terrific. It was an exciting, audacious, egalitarian union at the heart of some of the most important struggles of the first uh, couple of decades of the 20th century. And it was open to her as a woman. It was also open to immigrant workers, to black workers, to unskilled workers, to itinerant workers, the famous hobos, to everyone really that the more conservative American Federation of Labor did not want to organize or thought they couldn't organize. And the IWW led free speech fights in Missoula, Spokane, and Patterson, New Jersey. Those are the ones that Flynn was involved in. I'll say a little bit more about them later. And it was while she was organizing for the Wobblies that she met her husband, Jack Jones, a minor. The marriage didn't last very long, but it did produce her only child, Fred, known as Buster, uh, whom Flynn had when she was just 19 years old. In addition to the free speech fights, she played an important role in many IWW strikes, uh, some of the most important, again, of the early 20th century, including the 1912 Bread and Roses strike, the 1913 Patterson Silk strike, the strike on the Masabi Iron Range, um, and, and several others. And she inspired strikers with her rousing speeches. She rallied supporters in surrounding communities, harangued police, especially Irish American ones. Um, she, was, she was an absolute, uh, asset and, and quite um, quite popular. And it was while she was uh, involved in the Bread and Roses strike, the Lawrence strike of 1912, that she met Carlo Tresca. And this, uh, Tresca was an Italian immigrant anarchist, and this relationship was uh, like the relationship with Connolly. It had a profound influence on her politics, as well as her personal life. Tresca was the love of her life, but he was also an important political ally. She broke from the IWW in 1916. Nonetheless, uh, she was arrested for being a wobbly in 1917, and she was uh, arrested as part of the raids by the federal government that were designed to crush the IWW uh, at the outset of World War I. She'd written a pamphlet um, earlier in her, in her time with the Wobblies that detailed tactics for sabotage, which she called the conscious withdrawal of workers' efficiency, and that got her in trouble. She was charged under the Espionage Act, but she escaped prison by petitioning uh, President Woodrow Wilson. When she got out, she did, or, you know, when she avoided prison, she dedicated herself to helping out others who were not so, uh, so fortunate. In 1918, she founded the Workers' Defense Union to advocate for labor activists arrested and imprisoned under the Espionage Act during World War I. And she assisted numerous men and women, especially with those with no other organization to help them. And among them were Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, and at the time, Flynn was the first American to become involved in the Sacco and Vanzetti case. It was through her relationship with Carlo Tresca that she found out about them. They were unknown immigrant anarchists. They had, outside of their circle of anarchist comrades, they really had no support. And it was Flynn who really helped to transform their case from you know, a local story in the Boston newspapers to a global cause celeb. And so even though she parted company with the IWW in 1916, she remained a good comrade. As head of the Workers' uh, Defense Union, she fought for the release of imprisoned Wobblies, and she continued to organize other workers into the union, especially Black workers. And it, it you know, the, the history, the story of Flynn's, um, Flynn's relationship with Black radicals and uh, with uh, Black working people in general has yet to be written, but she was uh, one of a few uh, white radicals who um, were actively involved in um, campaigns to uh, when when the Messenger, a, a Philip Randolph and Chandler Owens newspaper, was suppressed during World War One. She was involved in a campaign to raise money and petition uh, to get the paper back up after the Elaine massacre. Uh, she was one of two white people who spoke at a meeting in Harlem, encouraging black workers to keep up the struggle, to organize into integrated unions, and exhorting white workers to. Uh, um, to, to feel and demonstrate and be willing to fight for uh, solidarity 
with uh, fellow workers, fellow uh, black workers. Um, at solidarity for her across lines of ethnicity and race and gender was absolutely essential uh, to the success of uh, working class struggles. In 1926, as the Sacro and Vanzetti case is nearing its terrible conclusion, she takes a break from public life. And why does she do that? Well, Carlo Tresca, Tresca and her younger sister Sabina, uh, who were living uh, under the same roof with Flynn and the rest of her family, uh, had an affair. And uh, she found out about it and she was devastated. The affair produced a child, um, Peter Martin, who actually went on to found City Lights Books in San Francisco, along with Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Um, but that, that devastated her. And she, for her health, her mental and physical health, uh, she took a break. She moved to Portland, Oregon, where she stayed for a decade with Marie Aqui, a physician, anarchist, birth control advocate, and out lesbian. And the two had a very intense relationship that lasted about a decade. Part two of Flynn's life is the Communist Party years, and those are the years from 1936 to 1964. And of course, she joined the Communist Party in 1936. I mean, that was, that's a no-brainer, right? She's a coalition builder by nature. Um, with the Workers' Defense Union, she united everybody, socialists, communists, vegetarians, trade unionists. So this was what she did. And so in the 1930s, uh, the Popular Front era, it made sense that she would join the CP. And like the IWW, when she first joined it uh, back in 1906, the Communist Party was the most active and the most exciting organization on the left at its time. And like the IWW, it was the most egalitarian. And Flynn was among its most popular members. She was elected to the National Committee of the party in 1938. She wrote a very popular column for the Daily Worker called The Feminine Ferment. And she was extremely busy. Uh, you know, raising money, raising awareness. Uh, she did four or five lecture tours a year throughout the U.S. at this time. Now, Flynn had been an anti-fascist since the 1920s. In part, uh, as I said earlier, her relationship to Tresca was really important to, uh, to her political uh, life as well as her personal life. And it was Tresca, uh, her relationship with him, as well as with other Italians she met during the Bread and Rosa strike, the Sacco and Vanzetti campaign, that, that brought uh, the rise of Mussolini and the implications of uh, fascism to her early attention. And so when most others on the left saw Mussolini and, and fascism as an Italian problem, she realized that in fact, fascism posed an existential threat to democracy everywhere. And she was the only Anglophone American and the only woman member of the first significant, or actually the first anti-fascist organization in the United States founded by Carlo Tresca in 1923. She was also active in the anti-fascist alliance of North America, which is the second organization founded that's the same year, a few months later. And she spoke uh, around the Northeast. She traveled around uh, meetings, uh, issuing warnings about fascism as an extraordinary danger to American democracy. In fact, she, uh, she lumped the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan and the American Legion together as American fascist organizations and said, just like the black shirts, uh, they threatened uh, democracy in the very fiber of US society. And um, at a time when Italian, radical Italian Americans were pretty much the only anti-fascist in the U.S., the only active anti-fascist in the U.S. Um, Flynn had an advantage, right, uh, as, a, as an American-born anti-fascist, um, whereas the Italian-American fascists, anti-fascists, um, had to be careful. Many of them actually had to hide their, you know, go keep their anti-fascist under the radar, right, um, from the, the Bureau of Investigation and from the Italian consulate because of fear of repercussions back home. Flynn, as a, as a US citizen, was free to bait Mussolini right and left to be extraordinarily outspoken, and indeed she was. Um, she titled speeches, things, uh, you know, with, with um, provocative titles like Mussolini's finger in American, America's pie. Or she referred to um, his regime as the castor oil regime. Um, and so she really stood out at this time. And of course, she was right, right? Her fears that fascism was a threat to democracy in the US and around the world are, are realized. In 1930, in the 1930s, as a member of the, the Communist Party, she raises money for the Republican cause during the Spanish Civil War, right? The first battleground um, of World War II, of the fight against fascism. Uh, that was World War II. And during the war, her anti-fascism is wedded to a concern for the survival of the Soviet Union. 
um, she realized, as did most communists at the time, or maybe all communists at the time, that uh, the war was not uh, a struggle among nations, a jockeying for power, right? But it was an ideological struggle to save civilization. And so she played an, a, a, a really important role, rallying American women and uh, Americans in general to that struggle. After the war, she was appointed to a number of leadership roles in the party uh, on women's initiative. She chaired the Women's Commission of the Communist Party. And I have here uh, a pamphlet that she wrote, an example of the kind of, uh, kind of pamphlets that she published at this time. You can see the picture. She's a lot older here. Looks a lot like my grandmother, my Irish-American grandmother, an appeal to women. Um, and she published a number of pamphlets and columns and, and uh, gave a number of talks as kind of the, the representative of women's issues for the party. Um, she also chaired the Women's International uh, Democratic Federation and took, in fact, she took her first trip outside the U.S. to Paris for the founding of the WIDF. And she was vice president of the Congress of American Women, the American affiliate of the WIDF, which was founded on March 8th, International Women's Day in 1946. And that's a really interesting organization. It's a feminist organization that offered what we would now call an intersectional analysis of women's oppression and that valued women's roles as housewives and mothers and challenged social and cultural barriers to women's emancipation. Um, and, and this is a final example of Flynn's ideological flexibility. As a wobbly, remember I said she scoffed at politics, right? She didn't even see the value of suffrage uh, for women. She saw it as a distraction. But as a communist, she became committed to politics as a site of struggle. And in fact, she actually ran for office as a member of the party. In 1942, she ran for Congress in New York, got 50,000 votes. And in 1957, she ran for the New York City Council, uh, where she got almost 700 votes. Um, so she was flexible, and right? this was all about the struggle. And that brings me to the third point. Um, and this is actually the major theme of, of my uh, book on Elizabeth Hurley Flynn, that she is a large, an important, but largely underappreciated figure in the history of civil liberties in the, in the US. And in fact, her career ex illustrates the major contributions that the left has made to the fight for free speech, free press, assembly, and a host of other uh, rights that we we enjoy. Mm, I hope uh, we continue to enjoy. That's another subject for another day. Um, decades before Earl Browder coined the phrase communism is 20th century Americanism, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn argued that those who defended civil liberties for working class people and working class movements, that is freedom of speech, assembly, right to hold one's own political opinions, etc., they were the torchbearers for the spirit that animated the founding of the nation. Her civil liberties activism began when she was a wobbly. As I mentioned earlier, she led free speech fights in Missoula, Montana and Spokane, Washington in 1908 and 1909, and also in Patterson, New Jersey in 1915. Her looks, her bravery, her sharp tongue, and her keen wit made her a superstar. She brought widespread attention to the cause of free speech, and she encouraged what historians of civil liberties call popular constitutionalism around the U.S. and around the world. And what popular constitutionalism is, it is just ordinary people talking about the Constitution, in this case, the First Amendment. What does it mean to have the right to free speech, press, and assembly? Gee, how far does that go? What are the limitations that should be imposed on it? And because of her activism, she, she developed some of the tactics that became standard tactics for the free speech movement. Um, these conversations started popping up all over the country in periodicals, newspapers, and in conversations, and all over the world. I mean, there, there's there's articles and letters that, that came in that were published where people were talking about the limits and the, the importance and the limits and the, uh, the rights of free speech inspired by Flynn and uh, the free speech fights. Um, she was an active member of many labor defense committees. She worked to free, free jailed radicals, uh, Haywood, Bill Haywood, Pettibone and Moyer, um, Tom Mooney and Warren Billings, uh, Joseph Etter and Arthur Giovaniti during the Bread and Roses strike, I mean, on and on and on. In 1918, as I mentioned, she established the Workers' Defense Union to fight for the rights of labor activists of all political stripes who had been arrested and imprisoned under the Espionage Act. Um, she also called for the recognition of political prisoners, and that's a really important point. Unlike many other countries in the, United, in the world, uh, the U.S. does not recognize political prisoners. 
We don't acknowledge that the state punishes some individuals because of their political beliefs and actions, not because they've committed crimes against people or property or health or the public good, right? So what happens here is the U.S. creates laws to criminalize political ideas, then argues that holders of the, those ideas are criminals. And Gurley Flynn said, no, no, we need to recognize that there are such a thing as political crimes and political prisoners. And she fought for decades for that recognition, unsuccessfully, alas. Uh, she also fought deportations. Uh, she saw um, that distinction between good immigrants and bad immigrants was a tool for dividing working people. And she would very much be involved, I, I, I believe, I, I know, um, in the struggle against deportations and the campaign to abolish ICE today. Um, because really the distinction between legal and illegal is just a contemporary manifestation of that distinction between good immigrants, meaning compliant immigrants, and bad immigrants, meaning organizers, activists, and radicals. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, because she was an Irish American, she she knew from an early age or her family's relationship with Connolly, the conversation she overheard. Um, she knew that imperialism uh, was a threat to the autonomy of working people around the globe. And she supported, as uh, the organizer of the Workers' Defense Union, she supported anti-imperialist struggles in the uh, late 19-teens and early 1920s in Ireland, but also in India. She actually uh, went to the first Indian Congress in New York uh, for the, you know, to support the struggle for uh, liberation. And she was a representative there and spoke. Um, she also was an advocate for uh, liberatory movements in Mexico. And um, later on, as a member of the Communist Party, she advocated for the liberation of Africans and Puerto Rico. And we see that in the Alderson story, right? She, she talks about the Puerto Ricans who were there, the, the Puerto Rican nationalists, the other politicals, as she called them. And so this was very, very important to her. And the Workers' Defense Union, right, where she launched all these campaigns, uh, was a model for the International Labor Defense Committee um, that would be so important in the 1930s and on, advocating for the Scottsboro Boys and et cetera. And Flynn actually chaired that committee from 1927 to 1930. In 1920, she helped found the American Civil Liberties Union. And she worked closely with uh, the head of the ACLU, Roger Baldwin, on a number of campaigns, including the campaign to save Sacco and Vanzetti from the electric chair, uh, unsuccessful, uh, un alas. And the story of her involvement with the ACLU, however, does not have a happy ending. In 1940, the organization succumbs to red baiting after the Nazi Soviet pact is signed. And they basically decide that fascism and Nazism, I mean, fascism and communism are essentially one of, and the same. Um, so they pass a resolution barring both uh, fascists slash Nazis and communists from the executive committee of the ACLU. And that resolution, by the way, is not repealed until 1967. And the, essentially the resolution is passed as a way to remove her from the executive committee. She's just too much of a liability at this time because of her membership in the Communist Party. Of course, she had joined the party in 36, so they knew she was a member when they invited her to be on the executive committee. But, you know, the red baiting happened, the Nazi-Soviet pact happened, and they just folded, the ACLU folded. They wanted her to resign, but she would not go quietly into the night. And I'm, I, I will quote you uh, a statement she read at her trial. Uh, the demand for my resignation is an attempt to force a minority to conform to the political view of the majority or get out. I refuse to resign because I will not be a party to saving the face of this anti-civil liberties majority, nor to whitewashing their red baiting. I am appealing to the real ACLU elements against such a demand. If this trial occurred elsewhere, it would be a case for the ACLU to defend. And indeed she was right. Many of those who sought her resignation in 1940 had been her allies in the civil liberties movement for two decades, Roger Baldwin among them. So ponder the irony here. Early Flynn had been an anti-fascist since 1923, before anyone else on the ACLU Executive Committee. And now, members of that committee were telling her that her political ideas were as dangerous as fascism. This was terrible timing for Flynn, her son Buster, um, that was his nickname. He died of lung cancer in March of 1940, so she was really going through the ringer emotionally. Although it surely hurt her, however, the decision was even worse for the ACLU. A number of people resigned, and uh, Baldwin tried to cover, saying the ACLU had always been anti-communist. Ha, that was a bald-faced lie, and everybody knew it. 
Um, but, but even more than tarnishing the reputation of the ACLU, the ouster of Flynn gave, did something worse, something that had far-reaching effects. It gave the liberal seal of endorsement to anti-communism. So, it, and here's, here's what I mean. Basically, you had people saying, all right, if even the ACLU thinks communists are bad, communists are as bad as Nazis, and if even the ACLU violates the civil liberties of communists, then it's okay for us to do so too. Right? So it, it really contributes to that flood of repression, uh, repressive activities that we see uh, in the 1940s and 50s and, and really uh, for decades to come. Now, Flynn never abandoned the cause of civil liberties, even after the ACLU abandoned her. But I will say in the in in about the ACLU and that decision, they reversed the decision in 1976. So 36 years later, uh, they they basically admit that there's no evidence that Elizabeth Gurley Flynn had ever violated the basic principles on which the organization was founded. Although they did acknowledge that the ACLU itself had violated those principles when it passed the resolution and pushed her out. Now, the same year that Flynn is kicked out of the ACLU, Congress passes the Alien Registration Act, otherwise known as the Smith Act. The Smith Act made it a criminal offense to advocate the violent overthrow of the government or to organize or be a member of any group or society devoted to such activity. And it was initially used against Trotskyites. And when that was the case, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, members of the Communist Party supported it. Uh, then it was used against Nazis. Um, and after World War II, the act was turned on members of the Communist Party. 1951, 11 uh, Communist Party leaders are tried. Uh, it's called the first Smith Act trial because uh, there was another. Um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn chaired the Smith Act Defense Committee. Um, but uh, unfortunately, all 11 of those CP leaders were found guilty. Um, in 1915, things get even worse, if, if uh, that's possible, and in fact it was with passage of the McCarran Act that required members of the Communist Party and 25 other organizations to register with the federal government. And Flynn herself saw the Smith Act, the McCarran Act, um, uh, all the other anti-labor, Taft-Hartley, all those other anti-labor laws uh, that had been passed as fascist-like laws. So again, you know, she saw that the there's the struggle continues, right? The pushback against fascism is constant. We a need eternal need for vigilance. And she published pamphlets. You know, I have a few here. Freedom begins at home. A bunch of other pamphlets where she explained the dangers of the law. Um, and then, in fact, she herself uh, feels directly um, the pinch when she is arrested um, and tried uh, in another trial, uh, 1950. One, in fact, she is arrested, and at the trial, uh, she acts as her own counsel, and she gives a, a moving uh, defense um, and an eloquent statement of the right of Americans to hold their own political opinions. And I, I'd like to quote uh, from this, from this, I think, masterful statement. We will prove to you that it is not the communists who have advocated or practiced force and violence, but that it is the employing class which has done both throughout the history of my life in the American labor movement. Like General Sherman Bell, who said in Colorado during a miners' strike, to hell with habeas corpus, we'll give them post-mortems. We will prove to you that it is not we who flaunt the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but that it has always been done by the employing class. We will prove that we are fighting here for our constitutional and democratic rights, not to advocate force and violence, but to expose and stop its use against the people. We will demonstrate that in fighting for our rights, we believe we are defending the constitutional rights of all Americans. We believe that we are acting as good Americans. Unfortunately, the court did not see it that way. And in 1953, all of the Smith Act defendants in the 11th, second Smith Act trial, including Flynn, were found guilty. Uh, the appeals process lasted for, uh, from 1953 to 1955. And um, at its conclusion, Flynn was sent, along with um, Claudia Jones, um, was sent to the Alderson Penitentiary. Um, actually, she was, there were three of them who were sent to the penitentiary. And the title of her Alderson memoir, reflects her commitment to civil liberties, right? My life as a political prisoner. Um, she had fought for that status all her life um, and she claimed it for herself when she was at Alderson. Um, 
Although uh, 28 months in prison was undoubtedly hard for an older woman, Flynn left Alderson unbowed. And I'd like to read uh, a quote uh, for you. I'm not writing this book to evoke any special sympathy for me or my comrades, though the injustice committed against us was great. I want the reader not to forget that in the United States boasted citadel of democracy, we were prisoners for opinion under a fascist-like thought control act. Our imprisonment was a disgrace to our country, not to us. But as she notes uh, a, a few paragraphs down, her aim in writing the Alderson story was not to call attention to the plight of communists in prison. Other people were doing that. The, her aim was to advocate for women who could not or would not, for good reason, advocate for themselves. And I believe she succeeded with the Alderson story. This is an important book. Um, it called attention to the need for prison re reform and it remains a timely and important book today. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn died um, in Moscow on September 5th, 1964. And upon her death, the New York Times ran a front page obituary. And in that obituary, they quoted a May Day speech that Flynn had given uh, fairly recently. And I, and I quote from that. Before another half century has passed, the contradictions of capitalism, its incompatibility with human welfare, and the growing demands of the people for peace security and happiness will result, I believe, in a socialist America. What a May Day that will be to celebrate. Hail to it and work for it. The Times then added, Miss Flynn's life was dedicated to that May Day. I could not agree more. Thank you. And now I'm happy to take questions, um, entertain thoughts and ideas, uh, really anything that you'd like to talk about. Okay, thank you. We will open the floor for comments and questions. If you have a comment or a question, please click the picture of the hand. Please click your raised hand icon and we will open your mic. Just a moment. Steve, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end by clicking the pic. There you are. Speak up, please. Steve, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Your mic is open on our end and on your end, but we can't hear you. Okay, sorry, Steve, we can't hear you. Norman, your mic is open. Norman, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Norman. How are you, Marianne? I'm okay. great. Great, great. Uh, a really fine, fine presentation, Marianne. Uh, in response uh, and in commenting on the presentation, just a few quick points. One, what I think is the most important one, Elizabeth Gurley Quinn has been marginalized in the history of the United States because of her commitment in the last part of her life, which fulfilled her life, to the major revolutionary movement, the real new left of the 20th century, the communist movement. Com Anti-communism in America operates throughout the political spectrum. As I see it, its model is color racism. If you make communists invisible and you can do anything you want to them and say you're a democracy, that's essentially what happened first to slaves and then subsequently through the system of segregation in the Deep South, blacks became invisible, they were demonized, and at the same time, everything that was being done to them was denied, denied. And that also became a model for the whole world, uh, for American imperialism, the American model of imperialism. So that's my major big point. Uh, your presentation was really fine. And uh, the, uh, the other point I would make, the second point, which is in some ways less important, uh, on the question, she is a movement person. And many of 
most of the people I know have been movement persons, people, but who are involved in the Communist Party and in the larger left movement. But uh, theory, theory is important also. Having uh, a general theory connected to a strategy that can not only mobilize and agitate, but win. And I think that's an important difference between the IWW and the syndicalist anarchists who were heroic people and courageous people and did great things, but ultimately couldn't follow up, couldn't deliver because of their anarchist philosophy. And uh, I think Elizabeth Gurley Flynn realized that after the Russian Revolution in the struggles that followed, and not only the Russian Revolution, anyway, anyway. Okay. Thank so, you, yeah. Okay, okay. And it was a very fine presentation, and uh, I'm glad my mic was open. Okay. <laughs> Norman, I, I, um, Flynn, although she was a syndicalist, she, I don't think she would have called herself an anarcho syndicalist. Um, I'm not sure you said that, but uh, she absolutely distinguished herself from anarchists. But I, I think, I think you're right. Um, you know, one of the things I think that was disturbing to her was so, so the, the IWW, this astounding victory in 1912 in Lawrence at the Bread and Roses strike, and then they leave. And so, you know, wage hikes for everybody, this glorious success, and then they leave and, and what's left, right? So structures, I don't know, theories as important um, to Flynn uh, as it might be to others, but, but certainly structure was, um, that you can't go in and build something and then just let it go. Um, so I certainly see that. And I, yeah, I do think that she'd be a lot better known had she not been a communist in the United States. Um, and even now, when a lot of people talk about her, they talk about her as the rebel girl, right? The, the, the wobbly uh, agitator um, and not uh, the, the, the member of the communist party, the head of the communist party. Um, so yeah, I think that that's important, but let's hope we can change that. Zachary, your mic is open. Thank you. Um, thanks for spending your time and doing this for us. Um, just something I, I kind of want to ask about if you could expand on. Um, it's kind of what, what Norma was talking about a little bit. You mentioned she wasn't much of a theory person. Yeah, during the presentation, you know, you, you know she, you're saying she's wrote pamphlets on sabotage and free speech, wrote various books and, and short stories. Um, changed her positions from being really anti-electoral to being, to accepting an, an electoral struggle. Um, what do you mean by, by she wasn't really a theory person despite her doing all this writing? Um, all right, so I think there's a danger to seeing, to, to closely identifying with the subject of one's research a little bit too much, so I'll, I'll acknowledge that I might be treading on that dangerous ground. But I, I think of Flynn's approach to theory, the, similar to the way I approach theory myself. Um, so I'm not going to try to get in her head, but I think that my head is similar to her head. So theory matters to the extent that it explains and, and helps you address the world as it is. Okay. So she read Marx. Marx was important. Um, she kept, she was an orator. That's, that's the other thing. You know, I, I, study rhetoric and I'm really interested in orators and radical uh, anti-capitalist orators and the practice of outdoor oratory and, and things like that. And, and so Flynn was an orator and she kept a journal. And in that journal, she noted, you know, quotes from Marx and ideas from Marx that she thought were important um, to speak about, to use, to um, exemplify or to, to illustrate or to reinforce a point. Um, but the theory never drove the analysis, right? So she was, I think, an empiricist. Um, she observed and then um, responded. And theory was important to the extent that it helped her to explain the world that she saw in front of her. But, you know, she was not inclined to argue about interpretation of Marx. Um, it was, uh, it, the idea was, look, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. Nothing in common. Beginning of story, end of story. Beginning of story, end of story. Um, and so... Uh, so, even in her writing, even in her it's writing, not deeply it's theoretical. Um, it is eminently practical. She's ex an extraordinary intellect, um, but I, I just don't think she's a very theory-driven radical. Um, and, and 
I don't think she needed a lot of theory. Um, you know, people are getting gunned down in a strike. You don't really need theory to tell you uh, why that's happening. And that's not to dismiss the importance of theory. Um, but I, I think if if we're looking at, I mean, she was, again, brilliant. Um, but if theory is the closed fist, Gurley Flynn's interested in the open hand, right? How can I take ideas and make them accessible to working people? And this is not... This is not patronizing, right? This is how can I make them accessible to people who maybe speak a different language or have a minimal formal education and get them to see um, the importance of solidarity. So in terms like solidarity, concepts like solidarity were really important to her. But if you read, for example, The Truth About the Patterson Strike, she explains that solidarity is more than a construct, right? It is a lived experience of commonality with other working people. And the way to get that across to working people is not to talk about it with them, but to get them out on the picket line, in demonstrations, singing together, marching together. So they get that kind of embodied experience of solidarity. Um, and so that's, that's, I don't know if that addresses your question, but that's, I think her relationship to theory is how does this help um, to explain the world and to enable activists um, to work to improve the world. Laura, your mic is open. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. What a great way to end my day. I just thank had you. a quick question. Um, how would you characterize her tenure as chair of the Communist Party? Was it was she more of a figurehead or was she hands on? What was that like for her as a very busy person? Yeah, you know, this is so so I I will tell you that this I'm actually digging kind of into this as we as we not as we speak, but you know what I mean? This is I'm sort of I don't I, I feel like I understand other facets of her, her career a little bit better than I do this one. You know, the first time she's, she was a brilliant orator. And then, you know, the 30s come around and she's talking on the radio. And this was a big adjustment for her. Um, she's a speaker. She then becomes a writer. She writes a column um, for the Daily Worker. So it, it's a, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way at all. It is by definition, a much more bureaucratic um, kind of activism than she had had done uh, for most of her life. Um, it's uh, it is a, a more constrained form of activism, especially you know after uh, World War One and as we get into the, the the second Red Scare and the Cold War. Um, it is uh, there is of necessity the, the Communist Party is a different kind of animal than the IWW. I mean, the IWW was a lot more freewheeling and kind of uh, improvisational. So the structure of the party, the um, the kind of the norms of the party are a lot different. And um, I'm gonna suspect, we don't have a lot of evidence of, of this, but I'm gonna venture to guess that she struggled um, to deal with the transition from this kind of more freewheeling, uh, improvisational form of activism, even with the workers' defense union, right, when she's engaging in this kind of uh, labor defense and this much more structured way, she's in charge. Um, and it, it's a different animal with, with uh, the CP. Um, she does hold leadership positions. I think um, there is a lot of... Uh, a lot of symbolism there though. I don't wanna say she was purely a figurehead, but certainly she carried a lot of symbolic value at this time. And let's face it, she's an older woman. And I mean, it's International Women's Day, right? So I think we wanna, we wanna keep sight on the, of the fact that she is a, a woman um, activist. And I, there's not a lot of room um, for older women um, in public life. And one of the things that, that, I, that I address in the forward to, to uh, the Alderson memoir is unlike, you know, Mother Jones, Mother Bloor, she won't, she never adopts the mother sobriquet, right? She refuses to do that. In fact, at Alderson, she says like, they could, they could say anything to me, but I would not let them call me mom. I had a child and he is dead and no one else will call me mom. Um, and so, you know, if you're not willing to step into that mother role, there really aren't a lot of roles open for an older, heavy set, um, and by the end of her life, ailing woman. Um, so I don't want to say she's largely a figurehead, but I suspect the transition was difficult. And I, I, and I know, because um, we, we still haven't resolved that dilemma today, there really isn't much of a place in public life uh, for older women, um, and particularly older communist women. 
Lowell, your mic is open. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, Lowell. Um, that, that was a great presentation. I was um, I was enthralled from beginning to end, and I had a two-part question, but I think the second part of my question, you might have answered to Laura's question, and that is how Flynn dealt with, I would say, misogyny or sexism in these movements. Mm -hmm. um, you you touched on the fact that she left the IWW in 1916, which I didn't know. But my, the first part of my question is what I'm going to I'm going to put it into context, but the first part of the question is what was the IWW doing to produce women like Flynn? And I say women because another marginalized woman that came out of a 25 year um, career, I guess I would say, of labor organizing was Margaret Sanger, who was a contemporary, if not a friend, a peer of Flynn's right. and Margaret Sanger also left in the late teens to found Planned Parenthood. So, my, and I'm just digging into that part of her life um, as well. But so I'm wondering what was the IWW producing to produce these, albeit marginalized, but phenomenal women that um, um, others, other groups did not, were not able to, um, provide the atmosphere for that makes sense yeah yeah well to start with the iww actually you know allowed women in right i mean the the the, the afl um did not permit women um and when the women's trade union league was founded in 1905 they, to organize women into unions the afl was decidedly uninterested um and the uh the iww in contrast let them in um and so Flynn was one of a number of women. Most there's a really good book called by Heather Meyer. Um, I think it's called Beyond the Rebel Girl. It's about women in the IWW, um, and I and I think it's worth reading. Um, I've actually published an essay on Flynn uh, Sisters on the Soapbox and Flynn and her women allies in the free speech fights. Um, some of them were suffragists and you know Patterson in 1915, but earlier free speech fights in Missoula and Spokane. There were a number of women who are activists. Um, Edith Frenette is one, a name that you might know, you might not know. Um, a bunch of women whose names we'll never know. Um, they were, they, you know, they came in from Seattle, they came in from, from around the Pacific Northwest to um, Spokane. They stood on the soapbox, they got arrested, they got, some of them got really badly abused. They, um, they sang, they distributed newspapers. I mean, they did all kinds of um, really audacious things because there was space for them in the union to do that. And and I think Flynn was really important in that regard because she modeled, and there are a number of, of wobbly women and women, you know, who worked in the textile mills in Lawrence and then even later on, you know, uh, women in the party who recalled, uh, I've actually, uh, the, during the Lawrence strike, there was a, a young girl who, um, a, a friend of mine has, had told me about this, uh, actually, who organizes the, the, organized the centennial of the Lawrence strike. He's uh, sending me a, a newspaper clip about um, a young girl in Lawrence who used to, during the strike, she would walk past the house where Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was staying every morning, just in hopes of catching a glimpse of her idol and her inspiration. So Flynn alone breaking through those ranks, I think, was essential. It, you know, that's the whole notion of representation. You want to see people like you doing things that you you wish you could do, but you're not sure because nobody like you has ever done them before. She did that uh, in the IWW with the free speech fight. She actively recruited women with the, you know, during strikes, she spoke to women strikers and said to them, look, tell your husband, you're not gonna stay home tonight. You've gotta be on the picket line. We need you. Um, so she encouraged that kind of activism, although she herself never wanted to be pigeonholed, right? I mean, getting back to the CP question, um, they, they really, saw the value of having her in these leadership positions in these women's organizations, having her write this column, the feminist ferment, um, at a time, you know, in the 19, or, well, she died in 64, but, you know, right when that, that moment where feminism was about to explode. Um, but she refused to be pigeonholed. Um, she, she chose at times to advocate uh, for women's issues, but she also chose at times to, to speak her own piece. And I think that was important. 
Um, she was friends, by the way, with Margaret Sanger, and there's a really lovely uh, correspondence between the two where Sanger is really, you know, taking off um, in her, her advocacy for birth control, but she's nervous because she's, she's got phobia about public speaking. And Gurley Flynn encourages her and says, you're great, Margaret, just get up there and be yourself and do what you do and you'll be fine. So even that kind of behind the scenes um, support, I think was essential, was essential. to drawing, drawing women drawing into the women movement. Into Connor, your mic is open. Connor. Good, ap <clears throat> Good afternoon, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Connor. It was such a pleasure to be hearing your presentation. I have a copy of my life as a political prisoner sitting right beside me, and it is a fantastic read. I would highly recommend each and every one of um, the people on this call to check it out. Now, one point that I think is super important um, is regarding theory, especially when it comes to having a position of leadership. And I would like to have your particular analysis on this particular quote from State and Revolution from Vladimir Lenin. So on the 18th page, he says, one can wager that out of 10,000 persons who have read or heard about the withering away of the state, 9,990 do not know at all or do not remember that Engels did not direct his conclusions from this proposition against the anarchists alone. And out of the remaining 10, probably nine, do not know the meaning of a people's free state, nor the reason why an attack on this watchword contains an attack on the opportunist. This is how history is written. This is how a great revolutionary doctrine is imperceptibly adulterated and adapted to current Philistinism. How can a leader of the Communist Party of the United States of America be so um, uneducated when it comes to these particular teachings, such as becoming another petty bourgeois Democrat? I don't I, if I gave the impression that she was ignorant of theory and of history, and that's incorrect. I, she certainly was not ignorant. She read widely, as I said, you know, she kept notes. She, but if I remember correctly, Lenin also said it's good to write about revolution. It's better to be part of it. Um, and I think that's, that explains Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, right? If there's a revolution, she wants to be part of it. Um, I think that explains her joining the Communist Party, uh, join, explains joining the IWW, you know, where is the work being done? And that's where she wants to be. Um, so I don't think she was ignorant, but I think that she was an activist uh, before everything else, a class warrior. Dan, your mic is open. Good evening. Uh, I've seen it noted that uh, Flynn left her state to uh, Dorothy Day's Catholic Worker House and also found where uh, Day had uh, given a really nice eulogy at uh, Flynn's memorial service, and that's included in the uh, Catholic Worker of November 1964 entitled Red Roses for Her in which uh, Dorothy Day said that Flynn embodied all that was beautiful. I was wondering if you might uh, have any information or insight into the relation that Flynn had with the Catholic worker movement. You know, it's interesting. So I, I, I believe her, so Flynn was Irish American. Her mom was Irish, though I don't believe she was Irish Catholic. Her family, her mom, Annie Gurley's family was Presbyterian. Um, and she shows a remarkable respect. I think uh, she's she's not a believer. Um, she historically, I think, she, you know, throughout her career, showed a remarkable respect for those elements of uh, Catholicism that were uh, dedicated to the struggle. Um, she probably would have been a fan of of, um, of liberation theology, uh, were she were she to know about it. Um, and I do know that she was fond of Dorothy Day during um, the, her Smith Act trial. She actually communicated with Dorothy Day. Um, you know. Day was one of the, the few people who um, was not afraid uh, to acknowledge that 
you know, a relationship with um, the Smith Act defendants, and they would exchange uh, notes, they exchanged correspondence, and um, I, I would imagine, I don't, I don't know a lot about this, but I would imagine that that it, given the Catholic worker movement's commitment to um, meeting the material needs of people um, where they are, I think she would have been supportive of that. I mean, her problem back going back to her earlier days, her problem uh, as a wobbly with the Salvation Army um, and and with other you know, religious organizations of a similar uh, bent was that. Um, you know, they told people, yeah, you know, don't worry about the here and now. What matters is the afterlife. And she absolutely had no truck with that. So I think that, that um, uh, you know, her respect for Dorothy Day was evident. Their, uh, their friendship was real. Um, Day, as I said, was very supportive of Flynn when she was uh, on trial. And, um, and I think that, that she would have had great respect for the Catholic worker movement. I don't, I mean, you've got me intrigued. I'm, I myself, I'm a 16 year veteran of Catholic school and very much a social justice, liberation theology Catholic. Um, so now you've got me thinking I'd really like to see what's out there about that. Um, I've not read uh, Dorothy Day's um, Red Roses for her, but I absolutely will. So thank you for calling that to my attention. Okay. Tonya, your mic is open. You have to open the mic. There you are. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I'm calling um, right outside of Philadelphia. And one of the pieces that I, um, you said, you mentioned it twice, that she didn't want to fit into the stereotype of or being pigeonholed as being a mother. I mean, it's, you know, letting the people call her, you know, the mother. And so what I would like to know is that what, and then you also talked about her divorce. I'm wondering, you know, every um, organizer and revolutionary and visionary, they have these, and you talked about her lived experiences. From your summation, could you give, like, could you provide, like, could provide, like perhaps some insight that, um, her child's death and her divorce and these pieces that she experienced as a woman could have shaped her activism? Yeah, so you're calling from Philly, by the way, I have to tell you, um, the, uh, Flynn, uh, some of her earliest speeches about Sacco and Vanzetti were delivered uh, in Soon after, you know, she learned about the case, she went to Philadelphia. And I, one of my favorite things anybody ever called her was a, a journalist writing for a Philadelphia newspaper called her a Bolshevik princess. So I, I kind of have a warm spot uh, for Philadelphia in regard to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, because I love that label. She's a Bolshevik princess. Um, but yeah, you know, here's the thing about, about Gurley Flynn. I, I, I I feel like she's a person, and this is, goes back to the, the first, I think, Norman's comments about, you know, because she was a communist, we don't know a lot about her. You know, there's, as, as a, I myself, right, I'm an activist, a professional person, and I've got children. Um, and I, I it, it was an extraordinary uh, struggle for Flynn. So she married the first, as, as the, you know, the, the line is, she, she fell in love with minors and she married the first one she met, Jack Jones, when she was out in Missoula. Um, but she got bored with him and came back East. And when he came, followed up and said, you know, what's happening? She, she didn't want to come out of her room. And she said to her dad, he bores me. And she, so she left her father with whom she was very, very close with the task of having to say to her husband, I'm, I'm sorry you bore her, she doesn't want to be married to you anymore. Um, and that sounds kind of mean-spirited and maybe trivial, but but I'm going to guess that it was not easy for a woman like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn to find an equal match, right? She's brilliant, she, you know, she's beautiful, and she's extraordinarily active and in demand and popular. And I, you got to wonder, um, you know, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, how many guys um, are able to deal with that. I mean, she, in Tresca, she finds a kindred spirit of sorts. They meet in 1912 at the at the at Lawrence, um, and their their affair is discovered when, during the the hotel workers strike a couple of years later, um, he there's a you know he Tresca jostles with police, and a, and a book falls out of his jacket pocket, and it's sonnets from the Portuguese, the poems of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, with a love letter from Flynn inside, and so of course this breaks. Um, and they were such celebrities at the time. They were so widely known that this is front page news. Flynn's marriage to Jack Jones, even, you know, 
was front page, not front page news, but it was very celebrated. I mean, these were the celebrities of the day and their relationships were fodder um, for discussion and for, you know, people followed them like they would um, any kind of celebrities. But, but I imagine even Tresca, right, wanted somebody and he, here he is, an immigrant anarchist, right, and an ardent anti-fascist in the 20s. He gets, you know, shot in 1943. He's gunned down in the streets of New York. Flynn, I, I think, never recovers from that, although they had been estranged since 1926 when he slept with her sister and fathered a child. But even Tresca wanted a more traditional woman than Flynn could be. Um, and so there's, you know, the, I think for a lot of men in the movement, there's this kind of double standard. They talk a lot about revolution and equality and justice and yes you know even even anarchists and in and iwws yes of course we'll open the movement up to women then they get home and they want somebody to put their dinner on the table um, and she just was not going to do that um with regard to her son uh, he dies very young he's he's like uh, He's, he's, he dies in 1940. He's born in 1909. Uh, so he, he is he is very young when he dies of lung cancer. And he, she found out about it only weeks before he died. Um, and that was a heartbreak from which, like another one, I mean, how does a mother ever recover from the death of her child? But that was a really difficult relationship too. I mean, at one point she was always on the go. Um, and remember, I, I mentioned that there's this gap between 1926 when she goes out to Oregon and 1936 when she comes back to New York. Her son is in New York living with her mom and her sister. So she, you know, she comes, she has this, she's got two sisters, a brother, her parents, um, and they take care of her son. So her mom, her sister, Sabina, her sister, Kathy, in particular, Kathy, if you read the Alderson story, is her most frequent and dedicated visitor. They raise her son. Um, she is just active and engaged with the movement. And her son really feels it. And at one point says to her, why did you have me? if you don't have any time to take care of me. And that, that really uh, uh, cut her deeply. And yet, you know, it was a sacrifice she was just not willing to make. Um, and I think unlike other activists like Emma Goldman, for example, who never, you know, talked, advocated free love and herself never had a child and never had to make those choices. Um, I think that really humanizes Elizabeth Burley Flynn. Those are choices I could not imagine making, but I can imagine the difficulty for her, for someone like her, of not making those choices. Um, it would have killed her, right, to, 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 to taste this freedom and then to have to give it up. Um, so I think it really raises a lot of difficult questions about the ability to combine motherhood with activism, um, to find love that also grants you as a woman freedom, um, to find somebody who's willing to be your equal, you know, um, in, in deed as well as word. And, and she, never managed to find that. Okay, on behalf of uh, all involved, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Trashiati, correct? That's correct, thank you. For uh, her presentation tonight, I join with all in um, congratulating her on such a fine presentation and uh, since she mentioned it earlier that she's developing a project on how to uh, talk about difficult issues to voters, we'd like to invite, once that project is uh, developed and completed, we'd like to invite her and her um, project mates to uh, make involve us in uh, a webinar discussing those matters. So. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Trashiati. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll join us for the next classes, April 26th and May 17th. So have a good evening. Thank you very much. Happy Women's Day. Thank you. Good night.